OK, can you see my slides? All good. All right, I'm going to start over. We're talking about the device model. Um, the title of the talk was 2.5. Um, it's also going to cover a lot of things that are new in 2.6, and many of the things that are inherited in 2.5 are present in 2.6. So this is a very core abstraction to the Zephyr kernel and the way that we're going to deal with hardware. Um, Carlos introduced me a little bit, so but I've been working on Zephyr for a while. I'm currently at Nordic, and um, the main reason I want to talk about the device model today is that the changes in the past couple of versions have been related to a really tight device tree integration. So that'll be my focus. For context, this is kind of a continuation of a talk that uh, was given in 2019 by Tomasz Burstika, who is the device model maintainer over at Intel. Uh, this was a great talk, and I just got inspired by it to try to continue on and see what's happened since then. So this is the, the talk kind of in a nutshell. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. I will try to leave some time for Q&A, but um, yeah, feel free to ask anything as you as you think of questions. So we're going to start with a kind of motivation for why there is a device model at all. And then we'll talk about how it works from a fairly high level. And we'll talk about what's new at a very low level. Let's start with why. Why should we have a device model? So, you know, you wake up one day, uh, you and your best friends, you say, hey, what if we made an RTOS, right? So that's something we've all all wanted to do. But not just a kernel, right? You want it all. You want SOC peripheral drivers, you want sensor drivers, you want a networking stack, you want Bluetooth, file systems, pre-built tool chains, a pony, everything, right? You see where this is going. That's what Zephyr's trying to be. And there are a lot of people involved in Zephyr, lots of hardware, lots of software, lots of companies that are sort of in between. You can come in too, because this is an open source project. If we uh, weren't disciplined about having a nice framework for this, then, this would not work, right? So this is the reason why there is a device model. It's kind of the unifying abstraction that um, all of the hardware support is built upon. And you know, kind of maybe you're thinking, you know, I'm a Unix programmer. I know what the I know what the model should be, huh? Right? Uh, and the file abstraction is great for Unix. And some Zephyr targets do have you know roughly early PDP11 amounts of memory, but this is actually not a great fit uh, for, for this RTOS, and I want to explain why. One of the things is that we don't want to require dynamic memory allocation, right? So having to open and close files is, is really not ideal. Uh, another thing about the, about the file descriptor interface is that, you know, read and write are pretty great system calls if you're actually dealing with a file. But if you're trying to deal with real hardware, you know, uh, especially from a user space context, you're going to end up using iOctal, which, you know, if you've ever had the pleasure of uh, using that system call, it's it's also got its problems, right? Um, the other thing about Zephyr is that system calls and user space in general are totally optional. So having a file descriptor table per process doesn't really mesh, right? There a lot of, you know, the, the context of process is not really native, right, um, to Zephyr. And finally, the build system, right? And, you know, Zephyr in general is a library operating system. So the build system makes this giant, statically linked binary with the kernel and the application in one address space. So we can skip a lot of overhead if we just create a shared data structure. And so that's what we did. That's, uh, you know, kind of too much motivated this in the earlier talk, but basically there's a struct device. And Zephyr's approach is to pre-allocate struct devices uh, at build time for the most part. These are ordinary C structures. Um, and the kind of twist is that you're going to configure them with domain specific languages that Zephyr inherits from the Linux kernel. And this is, like I said, really kind of the core structure to the entire driver model. So device tree, which I mentioned I work on a bit in Zephyr uh, earlier, is the device configuration domain specific language. It's, you know, it's kind of inherited from Linux, uh, but Zephyr handles the way that um, we go from the device tree to our struct devices a bit differently. And uh, I, I want to motivate that, right? So how do, how do we do this? Well, I'll need a little help from a friend. And this friend is Alice in Wonderland's Cheshire Cat. Uh, if you don't know this cat um, from the book, it has, a, it has a very special power. And the power of this cat is that it vanishes. Its smile is left, but the body is gone. Setting up devices in Zephyr is like this. You're gonna mess with this device tree. You're gonna fight with the build system. The build system is gonna run. The device tree is going to disappear, and there will just be the devices. 
there is a bit of a learning curve, uh, but hopefully you will learn to love this because it does have quite a bit of expressive power. So let's kind of move on from this sort of high level idea that there's a structure and we configure it with the device tree. Let's talk about some of these core concepts, APIs, drivers, and devices. Kind of simply put, here's a high level diagram and going from left to right, the idea is that a Zephyr application uses APIs to ask device drivers to do real work on actual hardware uh, via device structures that kind of control the driver. In the in the framework, the you know the application isn't really you know touching the hardware registers directly. This is all kind of done by the driver as mediated by the API. Let's kind of show you how that looks at a little bit more of a file system level. So the applications are kind of C or C++ as you as you choose as you see fit. The APIs tend to be C headers. The drivers tend to be C source code files, and then the devices are these kind of famous struct devices, which are allocated in the driver.c file. And as you might expect, there's there's a lot of these, right? There's a lot of all of them. So for example, here's you know kind of a cartoon showing how it looks. There's a spy API. Um, there's a variety of spy drivers. Each one of them is responsible for allocating its struct devices. Similarly, there's a PWM API. It's got its drivers. It's got its devices. And there are many more besides that. But importantly, everything is a struct device. And another kind of important point is that you'll see, you know, I'm trying to indicate this with color, that certain drivers are associated with particular APIs. And you got to use the right API for each device, right? So for example, spy API, spy device, all good. Now, don't mix these up though. PWM API, spy device, bad things happen. Don't do that. All right, so very briefly, I want to kind of talk about how we configure these drivers, how we get these driver source files built into our application. But, you know, uh, this is like 10,000 feet picture. Uh, it's not really the focus of the talk, right? So there's this other domain specific language called kconfig, which we also inherited from Linux. And the way that it's going to happen in your application is there's going to be a .conf file like foo.conf here, and that's going to tell the build system, hey, I want these drivers, but not those. And the main focus of this talk, however, is going to be about allocating devices inside of those driver source files. And like I said, we're doing that usually with device tree. And um, especially during development, you're mostly going to be using what's called a device tree overlay file. So you're going to get a, a base device tree, which is a tree data structure that's provided by your board. So when you build Zephyr, you have to build it for a board. That board has a device tree. And a device tree overlay is a file that modifies the device tree for an application specific purpose then that final modified device tree will be consumed by the device driver source code files and they'll use it to allocate the struct devices finally uh, the applications are going to use the same device tree to access those devices and like i said it is kind of complicated there is definitely a learning curve and, but there are a lot of big advantages as we'll see finally the last kind of high level piece that i want to show you is this picture about how we get um, these devices? And the answer is you really just get ordinary pointers. Um, and kind of at this point, once we've gotten here, the, the cat is gone and you are just working in ordinary C or C++. All right, so let's talk a little bit about kind of like how the APIs work and how this, you know, looks in, in, a, in a cartoon source code file. Let's say you've got a pointer, right? I've got my device pointer and I want to call some API functions on it. So just to show you that this is a general pattern, I'm going to make up a fake API function. So we'll call it API send, right? Uh, fake name, general pattern. As you can see, the first argument is the device pointer. And you know this is a pretty common way of emulating object-oriented programming in C. And following that are some additional you know, arguments like this my value thing, anything else, sort of additional context that's specific to the function. These generally return int and the value is usually zero on success, like that. And then otherwise on error, it'll be a negative number, uh, which is usually you know, a negative error no value. And that's you know, again, a convention that's borrowed uh, from Linux. So in order to find out what a particular function does, a particular API function does, you're gonna wanna look up its documentation. The, um, the header files have docs and comments and they kind of explain the return codes in each case. 
So here's the big picture. You get a device pointer, you call your API functions on it, you do your error handling, off to the races. But there's a lot hiding behind this kind of simple looking code. You know, for example, if there's no user space support enabled, then the API function is just going to run a driver callback directly with no additional uh, overhead. It's just going to pull a, a driver callback function out of the device structure and run it. Um, if you do have user space enabled, then these API functions transparently become system call wrappers, which are going to do things like check that the calling thread actually has permissions to use this device before running the callback in, in kernel mode. So it's pretty cool, uh, even though it looks pretty simple. Now, I want to move beyond this sort of cartoon example and, and give you a few real APIs just for flavor. So we're going to do three examples. Um, and links in the slides here go to the API headers for version 2.6, which was just released last week. So starting with the GPIO API, it'll do you know kind of what you expect. You can pass it a GPIO device, a pin number, set its logical value to one, like I'm doing here. You know you can do other things, set up interrupts, all that stuff. Uh, moving on to the PWM API, that gives you things like being able to set uh, a period and pulse width in cycles on a PWM device. You know, picking a pin that it controls, and it takes flags, which I've left at zero here. Finally, there's an LED example that I want to show you, which you know takes a device and an individual LED on it. Uh, and in this example, I'm turning it on every 200 milliseconds and off every 400 milliseconds. OK, so cool. Those are some nice examples, but you may be wondering, how am I going to learn these APIs? You know, like for real, show me where they all are. Uh, and I want to start with this documentation page. And I want to emphasize that this is kind of a theoretical way to learn them. Um, there is a page, which I've linked to here, uh, which has a list of all the APIs, um, including their you know, various metadata about them. And I don't want to knock this table too much. There is really good stuff in here. For example, the status is super useful to know, right? Because if there is a, a stable API, for example, like this first line in ADC, um, that's going to be much more difficult to change. You know, the Zephyr developers are going to send email to the mailing list if there's a, a proposed change. Experimental APIs don't require that much notice, so that's really useful. And alongside that, there are links to HTML documentation for each API. Um, however, I, I frankly think that the quality levels of these HTML docs are, are kind of uneven. So um, start there, but uh, you will probably need to read the source code to really understand how APIs are working. And that means you're going to want to find out where they are. So in practice, this is what you're going to do. You know, every API has an associated API structure, and you grep for it in the include directory in the Zephyr source code. Uh, and then you're going to find the name of the API you want in the grep results, and you know, you'll open the source and you'll read it. After that, you're probably going to want to look for samples. So you, know, you just look for your API header that you found in the previous step in the samples directory and see what uses it. Uh, maybe that doesn't always work. Uh, so in the worst case, you look for tests, right? There's test cases for every single API, so you can at least get a, an idea of how it works on various pieces of hardware by looking at how the tests are exercising it. Finally, uh, if you want to know about drivers, those are hierarchically organized in the source tree by API. So once you know the name of your API, you can kind of drill down in there and, and find the actual source code for your devices. OK, so let's go. Let's let's zoom back out again, and I want to talk more about this process of going from device tree to device. Because like I said earlier, this is a, you know, there are big changes in 2.5 and onwards um, related to this process. There is a device tree guide. Um, and basically what I'm going to do today is walk through high level information that's in this device tree guide. Uh, but I want to use really specific hardware because, you know, it can be very difficult sometimes to translate the more abstract information that's in the guide to, you know, my board, my sensor, right? And I want to answer the really, really big questions that I've alluded to earlier, which are how do I allocate these devices? How do I kind of configure what their behavior is going to be at boot time? And then from my application, how do I get these device pointers so that I can deal with them through the APIs that we talked about? I want to use real hardware. So I'm going to use this Bosch BME280 environmental sensor, um, mostly because I use it as a test bed. I use that driver as a test bed sometimes when I'm working on um, device tree or, or driver APIs like this. And so I'm used to it. And similarly, I'm going to use the uh, development kit board for the NRF52840 uh, from Nordic because I'm used to it. All right, 
So this sensor, this BME280 environmental sensor, can interface with the SOC via SPY um, or S2C, but we're going to start with SPY. So let's look at a real-life device tree overlay for this particular hardware configuration. It looks like this. Don't try to read the details too much. Uh, just like take a look at it. It's 11 lines long, right? It's a single file, like I said earlier. It modifies the base device tree that's provided with the board. And you know that's going to be useful when you're prototyping with a development kit, which you know doesn't really have the sensor. You know, just you jump it in and you write a device tree overlay kind of describing how it all works, and you can use it. So, like I said, don't panic if you've never seen a device tree in your life. I'm going to walk you through this. Starting with line one, this spy controller, I want to use a spy controller that's built into my SOC, right? And so the board's base device tree, in every case and in this case, already will have nodes in the tree that describe the available hardware. And just for the sake of example, I want to use SPY3. So that's what's going on on line one. Um, this kind of and SPY3 uh, open brace on line one says to the device tree tooling, I want to modify this node that has this identifier SPY3, right? And then the following indented block is modifying the node. All right, now let's take a look at this next line. It says compatible Nordic NRF SPIM. And what that means is that the SPY3 node describes Nordic NRF SPIM hardware. So that's basically device tree jargon for, you know, the vendor is Nordic. It's the NRF SOC family's SPY controller. Um, to introduce a little bit more device tree jargon, compatible is what's called a property of SPY3. And properties are key value pairs that are part of nodes. And this is the syntax for how you write them. The compatible property is extremely, like critically important. So you have to understand it when you're thinking about Zephyr device drivers, right? We talked about how drivers only work on specific hardware earlier, right? So that means that the nodes in the tree need to be kind of segmented by what sort of hardware they describe. And this is the mechanism that controls that. So the compatible property signals to the particular SPY device driver for my SOC, like, hey, this node matters to you. Nodes for different hardware are going to have different compatible properties. So looking at this on uh, additional node on line five, um, I'm starting to define a new node here, and it's got its own compatible on line six. And the you know line six compatible is Bosch BME280, right? So the SPY3 node is specifying the way that the device should get set up the SPY device, right? And the BME280 node is specifying how the sensor device on the SPY bus should get set up. Driver source code is going to look at the right nodes in the tree by filtering based on these compatible properties. Now, those are strings. You know, you're, you may be thinking to yourself, like, how, how do I know, you know, what to do? And here's how. There's this new documentation page in 2.5. Well, I say new, it was added in 2.5. Um, and you know, we've got 2.6 now and continues to improve. But it lists all of the device tree compatibles that are kind of built into Zephyr. And you know, for, for, for jargon reasons, it's called the device tree bindings index. And it's organized by vendor. So here are some of the Nordic related IP blocks that you can configure in device tree. And there are links to more information about each. And you know, the link to the SPIM one is in purple. Similarly, you know, there's a section in this index for Bosch devices. You can see that there are various ones and they talk about, you know, how to configure them on various different buses. So every link is going to take you to more information about how to write your device tree notes for that type of hardware when you're setting up your devices. Okay, let's, uh, let's you know, now we understand that there are nodes, they have compatibles. That's what tells the drivers what devices they're looking at. Let's talk about how to control actual allocation. Moving back to our device tree, um, there's this line three, which says status is okay on my SPY3 node. Now, status is another sort of critically important property, and it's what controls device allocation within a driver. By default, in my board's device tree, in this example, this node has a status which is disabled. Um, and so no device is going to get allocated for this peripheral. Uh, in the SPY driver. Since I want to use it for this example, I'm going to override the setting in my base device tree by setting the status to OK in my overlay. And if you're wondering, you know, how do I know about status? Well, you know, 
I've just told you, but also there is a device tree specification and it covers these sort of core concepts like compatible status um, and a couple of, at least one more that we're going to talk about later in the talk. Okay, so this line makes sure that I have a spy device for this particular spy bus controller, spy three. Now I've got a you know peripheral on it. I want to allocate the chip select. So for the sake of example, I'm, I'm showing this here on line four. And the way I do it is with this CS GPIOs property. Um, this property, you know, sort of happens to follow a really widely adopted convention in device tree that works on pretty much all spy controllers and which Zephyr inherits from Linux. Um, but, you know, if you didn't know that, you could find out uh, by looking for that spin page in the device tree bindings index. Um, don't try to read the whole thing. My main point here is that it documents, you know, all the available properties that you can set on the nodes. It tells you type information. It tells you what they mean, uh, and you'll get sort of example device tree overlay syntax that you can use in your overlays or in your device trees. So, like I said, the bindings index was added in 2.5. We're constantly improving it. I really strongly encourage you to bug your vendor, bother your hardware vendor if they don't have good device tree documentation, because this is what you need to know. Now, since you know you can't really read that, I'm going to break it down. Uh, it's got it's specifying a single pin, uh, and the first you know piece of information that I want to know about this pin is the GPIO controller that is in charge of the pin. The second thing is the pin number on the controller, and the last bit is uh, actually some flags. So this is a C preprocessor symbol. So the device tree is actually run through the C preprocessor, and that lets you do things like, you know, or these symbols together uh, to make a bit mask. Um, and in this particular case of this pin, you know, we have a, a active low chip select, so I want to signal that through these flags. Uh, don't worry too much about, you know, the details if, if this feels like a lot of information really quickly. The main point that I really want you to understand is that, you know, I'm defining the way that my device should get set up in my overlay, and the driver is going to use that information to configure the hardware at boot time. So, you know, enough about the, the SPY uh, device. Let's talk about the actual BMA280 environmental sensor, which is on the SPY bus. So here's the node. Now, Zephyr has a driver for this um, compatible, but my board doesn't have the sensor built in, right? So that means that the device tree that's associated with my board, that's kind of my default device tree, doesn't mention this at all. So what I'm doing here is creating a node that defines it with the appropriate compatible that I got from the bindings index. And you can see that there's kind of some hierarchy, there's some additional indentation. You know, this, uh, this node is indented relative to SPY3. So this is a uh, device tree syntax for making BME280, this BME280 node rather, a child node of the SPY3 node. And this is another incredibly common pattern that you'll get familiar with as you gain experience, which is that bus devices are, are child nodes of their bus controllers in general. And so my SPY sensor must be a child node of my SPY controller. And this hierarchy is really powerful because it lets us associate them together. To show you an example of how that works, you know, I want to specify what, you know, chip select is associated with the particular sensor, right? I've only defined one, but, you know, what if I had two of these sensors on the spy bus? You know, I would, I would want individual chip selects for each, right? And um, this is, in this case, this is done with the reg property. So reg is another really important device tree property that's kind of got its core definition in the specification. And it's a general way to describe hardware addresses, I would say. Um, kind of as a simple way of describing it. The values are going to differ by hardware type, of course, because different hardware has different addressing conventions. So for spy devices, reg set to zero means I want to use index zero in the CSGPIOs uh, property of my spy controller, right? Which I know which one it is based on the parent-child relationship, which is GPIO one, pin 12. So this is another, you know, kind of common convention that Zephyr inherits. Uh, the important thing that you need to understand, though, kind of from a more high level, is that you need to pick up some general patterns for the hardware bus that you're interested in, and then you can configure devices by defining nodes and properties in a hierarchical way. The bindings index, again, is what's going to help you if you're not really familiar. So let's start to move towards uh, actually getting some C code. Um, I want to call your attention to this my sensor thing before we do. Uh, this my sensor before the, the colon right there on line four. 
So this is an arbitrary identifier. I could have called it your sensor. I could have called it foo. I could have, you know, whatever. This hey, Marty. Type, yeah. Uh, there's a there's a few questions in the chat uh, related yeah. to uh, this device tree here. If you could address those, I will at the end. Like, a, okay. uh, sorry. Yep. Okay. No problem. Ready. There should be about ten minutes left for Q and A. Um, okay. So I, I just I'm looking at my slide notes and I can't like flip context right now. Sorry. Uh, so this type of thing is called a node label in device tree jargon, and it's going to be really key to getting the struct device pointer in the example code later on. Okay, so so watch out, watch out here. Don't get confused with the my sensor node label on line four, and the label property BME two eighty on line six. Um, starting in two point five, you can use either one of these to get your device pointers. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the label property much more in this talk, though. But just you know, for now, remember this: label property is old and busted. Node labels are the new hotness. And it's really unfortunate. These terms, like we didn't invent these terms, like the label property is also part of the spec. And you know, the concept of a node label is also part of the spec. And the fact that the word label is overridden here is very unfortunate, but I'm going to show you the right thing to do. OK, so now we've kind of set up our overlay. We have some general ideas. Uh, the talk is being recorded if you need to rewatch this. Um, let's talk about how we're going to go to the C code. All right, so we we introduced kind of from the, the sort of high level, how do I deal with uh, APIs that I need a device pointer, right? And this is how you're going to do it. You're going to get this pointer dev to your BME 280 sensor device, and you can put this into your application. And as you can see, it uses these sort of magic macros, um, and these are going to be using device tree data. So do you remember that my sensor node label from earlier? Here it is again. And what I want to show you here is that I'm using the device tree API to refer to the node from C using its node label. And from there, I will ultimately get the real device. The other key piece of this picture is this, this device DT get macro. And this was added in, in 2.5. And its job is to either get you a pointer to a real struct device created from the device tree or call, uh, you know, cause a build error if there is none. Um, and this is this is a real you know, build time pointer. So I've got my device pointer, but like I said, it's just some random pointer to, to actually what's a global variable. Um, and we don't have any idea at runtime if the device was initialized correctly. Uh, and the reason why that's relevant to you is that devices are initialized at boot time by the operating system before your code runs, right? Before main in the application runs, your devices are either all up and running or something went wrong. And you know, any number of things can go wrong, of course. So we need to decide at runtime what to do with the device. And the way that we do it is with this devices ready function. This was also added in 2.5. And the short story is it's just not safe to try to use device pointers that aren't ready. Um, so don't do it. But let's assume it's ready. You know, we can just use it, and here's an example with the sensor API. Yeah, it's you know, kind of a few lines of code. I've skipped the error handling for brevity, but what it's doing is that it's getting the ambient temperature in degrees Celsius from the BME 280 device and printing it out. That really is it. Uh, there's there's nothing kind of bus specific. There's nothing vendor specific, and there wasn't any manual setup. Cool. Uh, that's pretty cool. I want to give credit to Peter Bigot for adding all of the infrastructure that underlies device DT get to Zephyr. And the results of his project have pretty far reaching implications beyond just getting devices. And so I want to start exploring that in a bit more detail. So, like I said earlier, you know, kind of combining this DT node label with device DT get is usually the easiest thing to do um, from application code, but um, if you're more familiar with the device tree API, you might know that this DT node label thing is, is what's called a node identifier, which is like a magic macro for referring to some node from C. And you know, one really cool thing about device DT get is that everything that is a node identifier works with it. So if you're you know, an experienced device tree user and you know what aliases are, you can pass an alias to device DT get and it'll give you a device. Um, if you are writing a device driver and you know how instance numbers work, you can pass you know, 
a node label created from an instance number. And we'll talk a little bit about those more later to device DT get, and you'll get a device or a build error. Anything that the device tree.h API documentation says is a valid node identifier can be passed to device DT get. You'll either get a device or you'll get a build error. One warning though, uh, please avoid using DT inst outside of device drivers. Uh, various Zephyr samples do that. It's kind of a bad idea for various reasons. Um, and I'm in the, the middle of, of cleaning it up right now. Okay, uh, let me see if I can, if I can before I, I switch gears, I'll try to load the chat. So there should be time for Q&A. Some of the questions, um, I think, were related to some of the slides that were before. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. OK. Could, would you uh, mind reading them out loud, Mati, for yeah. the benefit of the recording? Thank you. Yeah, of course. So let's see. I'll start here with, uh, is there a redundancy between driver and device tree? Um, we're we're going to talk about overhead a little bit more later, so I'll address that question later. Uh, can I explain why the at n and reg is hex n redundancy is needed, Benjamin Lindqvist? Uh, because of the spec, it's just the device tree spec. Sorry. Uh, Adib Taraben asks, there is no status for BME 280. Does it create the device? Yes. Excellent question. So if uh, if status is missing, then you assume that it's okay. But if it's explicitly set to disabled, which in this case is what happens in my board device tree that I want to modify, no device. So a device has to sort of be explicitly disabled for there not to be, oh, sorry, a device tree node has to be explicitly disabled for there to be no device. Um, since the, in that example, there is um, no status at all, it's assumed to be okay. That's kind of the default value. Uh, I thought the outer label was for accessing it as a generic API, i.e. your code could access the alias PTH sensor zero without having to know if it's a BME 280 or whatever. Uh, I don't understand the question. Sorry, maybe you can uh, refine it in the chat. Um, does it, yeah, and so in terms of overhead, uh, uh, sorry, I'm not Greek. Uh, does it cause performance overheads? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about more about overhead. Uh, later on, the short answer is that there's no additional overhead behind the uh, behind the overhead that's kind of implied by the device model. And the final question is: Device get binding explicitly not recommended nowadays? Uh, you will see why. I for me, the answer is yes. So, whenever the driver is allocating the devices from device tree, which like should be most drivers at this point, um, there are a few holdouts. I think like some USB drivers and things like that are not are not doing that. Um, you should you should use device DT get or or uh, any one of the related APIs. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Um, thanks for the questions so far. Uh, I want Mate, to sorry to interrupt. There are a few more questions, but that uh, I think you can address them those later. Yeah, I don't yeah, think they're yeah. related to a particular slide. Okay, thank right. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's do let's do an I squared C example. Um, just like I showed you with Spy, uh, I want to show you a device tree overlay that uh, you can use if you want to talk to the exact same sensor, but over the I squared C bus. It is. Uh, it's kind of the same length as before. It's also 11 lines of code. Um, we're going to do a similar walkthrough, but I'm going to go a little bit more quickly this time since you have some flavor of the of the concepts now. So the first three lines are really similar. I'm modifying an existing node that I got in my board's device tree. In this case, the I2C0 node uh, on line one, right? Uh, it has a different compatible, um, which I'm kind of showing here is Nordic NRF TWIM, and that's the compatible that's associated with the, uh, the I2C bus controller on, on the SOC that we're using in this example. And finally, I'm setting the status to OK, just kind of for, for clarity here. Now, sorry, Mati, oh, sorry. I, I, it hadn't switched for me. It switched now, so it took a while. Uh, the slide, we were still showing the, the title so oh. while you were describing. So it switched now for me, hopefully for everybody else as well. OK, so do, do you see configure bus pins now? No, I, I do. Sorry, yes, I do. Um, but we were seeing the title slide a, minute, a few seconds ago. It's okay. fine now. Great. All right, so uh, yeah, you may have noticed that I skipped over how to set up the other spy pins besides chip select uh, in the previous example. 
And the reason why is that this aspect of bus configuration tends to be vendor specific. Um, and I want to tackle that here in the I squared C example uh, for the data and clock lines associated with the bus, uh, just because there's fewer of them and it'll, it'll help me fit it on one slide. Uh, in this case, I have to set SDA pin and SCL pin properties uh, on the I squared C node, and they take these crazy magic integer values. So maybe you're wondering, like, how do I know? How do I figure that out? And what do I want to put in there? Um, once again, you use the bindings index. Uh, it is documented in there for this compatible. I'm showing you what the documentation is for the FDA pin. You know, it tells you its value. It tells you what to put in it, you know, depending on what pin you want on this particular SOC. And finally, it, it does mention that it's required. So if the, you know, if the final device tree doesn't have a definition for this property, then you'll get a build error. And there's a link to that, um, that page in the bindings index. So that's kind of how we set up the bus. Let's talk about the sensor. Um, here is the sensor node. So just like with SPY, it's a child node of its bus controller, except that in this case, the bus is I2C, the bus node is I2C0 instead of SPY3. The BME280 node itself, though, is really similar to the, to the SPI example. You know, for example, it's compatible is the same, exact same. And the fact that it's a child node of uh, I squared C bus node is what signals to the build system that it's on the different bus. And the driver source knows about the node because it has the same compatible, like we talked about earlier. Um, but it also knows that it needs to talk to the sensor over I squared C, specifically because of the device tree hierarchy. And that lets us address it differently. So in this case, reg is hex 7.7. Um, and earlier I said that reg is a sort of a unified place for describing addresses, right? And in this case of I squared C devices, reg values are I squared C bus addresses. So uh, hex 7.7 is what the I2C0 bus master is, should be using as the device address. That's the overlay. That's a pretty hard, different hardware setup. What do I need to do to my C program to make it work? Nothing. Uh, the same code works in this case. And to me, that expressive power is a big reason why all the device tree complexity is worthwhile. You know, I mentioned earlier that there's really nothing Bosch or Nordic specific about the source code. So I could swap out my device tree and target a different temperature sensor on a different SOC without any source code changes. And uh, to me, that's that's pretty magical. But we are, as firmware developers, incredibly suspicious of magic, right? Like, oh goodness, a tree, you're probably walking this tree. Like that's gonna take up a bunch of flash. That's gonna take up a bunch of text with tree walking code. It's gonna be brittle. It's gonna be error prone. Like, you know, show me that this is actually worth the benefit, right? Um, this is kind of the big important message that I wanna show you. There isn't any additional overhead. Uh, the power of device tree uh, doesn't come at any additional footprint or performance cost beyond the callback overhead that is inherent to the driver model itself. There is a learning curve overhead, but in terms of the results, uh, there's no kind of overhead in your firmware binary. So let's start to prove that by looking at what the you know macros that we use in our applications to get device pointers actually expand to. And this is what it expands to. Uh, you know, it's just getting the address of some global variable. And I want to sort of talk more about how we how we do this. How do we go from this my sensor token to a variable with this random number in it? So to build that up, I'm going to move back to the driver. And I'm going to introduce this concept called instance numbers, which are related to the compatible with this code. So if you look at this, it's just defining a macro. And I said earlier that drivers know what to look at based on the device tree compatible that they're interested in. And if you're a driver author, you're going to need to get really familiar, or if you want to be a driver author, you're going to need to get really familiar with this particular device tree macro, DT, DRV, compat. And you can kind of read that as the device tree driver compatible. Um, and you can see that its value is, is, is a token, not a string, uh, that nonetheless kind of comes from the value of this compatible property. And the tooling, the device tree tooling, is basically going to create 
something called instance numbers. And instance numbers are basically numbers from zero to n minus one, where n is the number of enabled nodes with that compatible. Uh, and this this particular line is for the BME 280 driver, and it's you know there's a link to where it's defined. But the the big concept is that for every driver, it's going to define its own compatible, and that's going to cause the you know at preprocessor time the tooling to tell you okay well here are all the nodes and what are we going to do with that well it uh, it's a little monstrous so don't panic but here we go okay this is this is sort of the the big snippet from the bme280.c driver that uses this dt derv compat along with some existing device tree tooling and some new stuff that happened in 2.5 or newish stuff right uh let's call your attention to a couple of things. All right, so there's this BME 280 define, which takes an instance number uh, on line 467 at the top, and then on the bottom line, it's getting passed to another macro called DT inst for each status OK. And what it's doing in the end, as I'll show you, is allocating a device for every BME 280 node in the device tree, which is enabled with status OK, indexed by these instance numbers from 0 to 1. And the sort of key 2.5 piece of tooling is this macro, device DT inst define. Um, so what it takes is an instance number, and it's an instance of whatever device tree compatible this driver is interested in, as determined by that DT derv compat macro that we saw earlier. It takes a bunch of other boilerplate, and it allocates a struct device. And a big part of what happened in terms of the device model in 2.5 is that almost all the drivers were converted to use this or, or similar macros that are related to it to be device tree aware. And the outcome is that devices are now global variables with unique names, and those names come from information in the device tree. So let's kind of cut through all this crazy macro stuff and see what it looks like. And in the driver, this is, this is actually part of what it expands to. Um, it's a global variable. And it's got a globally unique name, which has that random 63 number. And that number is called an ordinal number. And an ordinal number is basically a numbering of all of the nodes in the device tree. And for each instance of the compatible that we're interested in, the driver is able to allocate a device with a unique name. And the uniqueness comes from the ordinal numbers. To motivate this a little bit more clearly, I'm going to switch to using multiple different BME 280 nodes in the same application to kind of make it more clear. So here's the idea. We say this is, you know, when you when you talk about a multi-instance driver in Zephyr, you may have heard that term. That's what we're referring to is multiple different um, struct devices, which come from multiple different device tree nodes, all with the same compatible. And this is the overlay. There are two BME 280 instances in this overlay. And, you know, Squint at it, don't try and read it too much, but basically I've just copy pasted the two overlays from before. So there's two BME 280 nodes, right? One is on SPY and one is on I2C. This guy is on SPY with node label on SPY. And this one here with node label on I2C is the one that's on the I2C bus. But other than that, it's it's the same. You know, I've just modified the node, the, uh, the node labels um, to be different for each one of the nodes. And here's what the driver is going to macro expand to. You can see now that there are two construct devices. And you know, again, this happened at preprocessor time. So this is like literally what's going to be in the C file that gets compiled. So you've got two global device structures uh, with different ordinals in their names. And we got those ordinals from the device tree nodes, again, at build time. I want to make it clear here that the instance numbers are not the same thing as the ordinal numbers, right? So the instance numbers for two nodes are, well, zero and one, um, but the ordinals are, in this case, uh, are 65 and 70. And you know, you can see how they sort of jump around from build to build. Uh, this is actually going to hint at some additional things that are going to come out of this work. Uh, but the the big idea for now is that ordinals are sort of specific to the final device tree, and they're not the same thing as instance numbers. Now, of course, you know, the ordinals kind of have to be different from the instance numbers because otherwise the device structures names would not be globally unique. So let's look at the uh, application now. 
right? Okay, here's our application. I've modified it a little bit so that now I get two device pointers. And I'm doing this by using the onSpy and on I2C node labels that I put into my overlay. And at preprocessor time, this is what this turns into. In case you're wondering, there, there is a little bit of additional magic that pre-declares all these potential devices in a generated header file. Um, so that's how come you don't have to declare these before dereferencing them. I mean, sorry, taking their addresses. So, but the point is that the results have the same footprint as any other access to a global structure. So we're, we're combining a hierarchical configuration language without the footprint and performance penalty of doing any tree walking. The downside is that the error messages do take some getting used to because of all the macro magic, right? If you, you know, if you kind of mess this up, then you'll get a link error that says, I don't know what device DTS or it is, uh, DTS or 70 is, right? Um, but now, because you came to this talk, you know how it works. And there are some additional notes in um, the device tree how-tos on the documentation, which sort of help you figure out what went wrong. The ultimate fallback, which I do do uh, when things get really messy, is that I just look at the macro expansions, right? You can ask CMake to save the temporary files, and that'll include the results of running uh, the preprocessor. And, you know, I just run them through Clang format, and I look, and it's usually very obvious as, as a kind of a final last resort what went wrong. Here's the, the picture again, kind of combining the results in the driver with the results in the application. The device tree is gone and we're just dealing with some globals. It's like the Cheshire cat. It's, it's vanished, leaving only the smile. And what enables this is that the device model itself is much more aware of device tree since 2.5. So when we allocate devices, that's kind of made device tree aware, and that's what enables this magic. And we're you know kind of building more upon this in 2.6 and beyond. And I want to hint at where we're going with this. So those are the big ideas uh, that I want to talk about in detail, but I want to give you some hints about, so where, where, what are these other cool things that we're, we're building on this? And this is sort of the big insight, which we kind of hinted at intuitively. You know, for example, a spy device depends on its bus controller, right? Uh, and I mentioned earlier that ordinals kind of jump around as you change your device tree from build to build, but they are related to this idea in the following way. They're not just a random numbering of the nodes. They actually capture the dependency structure of the entire device tree. And we have this at build time. I mean, you know, actually at preprocessor time, which leads to an amazing outcome, which is that now if we use this, we can know all of our firmware device dependencies at build time. Um, and there are device tree APIs for querying the forward and reverse dependencies of any node. Now, as you know, time is going on, that awareness is being added to the device model um, in the same way that the device model previously became more aware of device tree nodes. Now, additional dependency structures are being added to the device structures, which come from device tree. So this has some pretty profound implications. Uh, in particular, you know, I wanna highlight two examples. Uh, the first one is initialization order, and you know what everything depends on. So you can create at link time, uh, you know, an ordering of your devices so that you can initialize them properly without reversing dependencies. You can make sure that you don't try to initialize the BME280 node before its bus controller is already initialized. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, this has implications for sort of runtime device power management, right? So you wouldn't want to you know, clock gate your spy bus if somebody else is dealing with, you know, a BME 280 on that spy bus. And you can track those dependencies now using this information. So, uh, yeah, credit to, to Flavio Seolin at Intel and uh, Gerard Merul uh, who are working on this. Um, I want to wrap up now. Zooming out again, you write your device tree. That results in device allocation. You get pointers, which you deal with through these APIs. As of 2.5, these are global variables that are created at build time. The hierarchy inherent in the device tree, we, we can capture it, and that's increasingly being leveraged within Zephyr. There's no overhead in, on top of the device model overhead. 
the power of you know having a device tree overlay or having a device tree for your board is that you can make as many devices as you want right previously a lot of a lot of drivers could only have one instance of any device and now by changing your device tree you should be able to you know have multiple instances and if your driver doesn't support multiple instances then it's a bug and you should bug your vendor and make them fix the bug and you don't have to use it if you don't want to you know, the kernel requires a clock device, but you can otherwise pretty much completely bypass the driver model and interact with peripherals directly if you really need to. Um, you know, you don't have to bounce, you know, your interrupts through this extra driver model. If you don't want to, you can declare direct interrupts um, and deal directly with the registers in your application. Uh, there's another talk which is going to mention this uh, at the same conference, uh, also by my colleague Gerard Meadow. Okay, final things, use the bindings index. If you're confused, that's your first bet. We are trying to improve the driver and SOC documentation. This is a really hard problem because of all of the different targets that Zephyr supports. Um, for now, that's the best thing I, I personally think I can offer you and to beyond that to read the source. And that's all I have for you today. So thanks for your time so far and I'll look at questions now. Okay. Um, I'm using LEDs as GPIO pins. I'm using, okay, this is a kind of specific question about a particular application. Uh, please ask on Slack. I think I recognize your name from Slack. I'll try to help you. Uh, okay, Kasun, regarding at n, search for unit address in the documentation. Thank you. That's that's an earlier, that's a reply yeah, to an early reply. question, yep. Okay. Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, a question. Uh, IMUs usually have FIFOs using raw values. What is the plan to implement FIFO bulk data transfer? Yeah, so I assume that this is a question about the the sensor API that I was showing. Yeah, I think that that you know that is definitely a, a shortcoming um, for high throughput sensors. There was an effort by um, oh Bfrog on GitHub to develop a driver. Tom Burdick. Tom Burdick. Tom Burdick. Sorry, yeah, thanks, Carlos. Uh, to develop a driver framework called RTIO. Uh, which was targeted at kind of these more high throughput sensors. He had an IMU application. I would encourage you to ask on Slack on the sensor channel. Uh, that, yeah, that needs to be improved um, for that particular type of sensor is the short answer. Um, okay, uh, Benjamin says the inner label is BME 280, node label. Do you mean label property? Yeah, this is confusing. Uh, yeah, the, the label property is the string BME 280. Uh, while the outer label can be PTH sensor zero, you, you can use macros to access the outer generic label. Yeah, and so like again, this is this is confusing. The device tree is you know using the word label in two different ways. Um, you can use both of them to access the devices, uh, but node labels are kind of better. TLDR. Um, let's see how much time do we have left. We have a few minutes. Uh, Okay, Mike Handler asks, will Zephyr code eventually remove use of hard-coded pin numbers and instead use the DT to get pin numbers? Uh, that's a Nordic question. And the answer is, I tried to do that, but it didn't work well with the pin control driver and Piotr Minkowski, the GPIO and pin control maintainer driver got me to revert my changes. And we're trying to figure out a, a better uh, device tree binding for Nordic SOCs that doesn't use these annoying pin numbers. Um, so we're, we're trying. I have so far failed. I'm sorry about that. Uh, James Johnson asks, sorry, I came in late. Did you go over where the YAML bindings fit in? No, I didn't. And that's a great question. Uh, so the the way that the, the glue between the device tree um, and C is controlled by a configuration language called bindings. And that's why the place where you look for information about your device tree nodes is called the bindings index. It's it's literally an index of files that are called bindings. And these bindings are YAML files that describe what you can do with a particular compatible. And that feeds into the tooling um, that I maintain that translates this sort of hierarchical data structure to this giant generated C header that you can query uh, at build time to actually create these devices. And that's that's how it works. That's how you know, these drivers and applications are, are actually using these macros. OK, that's all the questions so far. And I want to give everybody a, a chance to move on to the, the next talk. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Matty, very much, uh, and everybody else for joining. And uh, look forward to seeing you in other talks uh, during this Developer Summit. Thank you, everybody. Bye.